and welcome to One Light Portraits. And we have our special presenter with us who is going to lead us through an entire new series, a new exploration of lighting really from the ground up. Welcome to Tony Corbell. Thank Tony, you very much, Mr. Brady. So great to have you Glad here. Glad to be here. <clears throat> I have learned so much from this man over the years watching him. Just this morning we were doing some stuff and I learned some new stuff that maybe I wasn't doing the right way. And uh, you guys are going to have a lot of fun with this. So before we get started, and before I officially introduce Tony, That's right. <laughs> so Tony, a master of light, a master of photography. Uh, I've watched his educational series myself over the years and have learned so much. Uh, he's just a great educator, he's a great photographer, and he has a way of just putting things across that are so easy to understand. So it's a real honor and, and a lot of fun to have you here. So really, why are we here? Well, for, for me, I think the main reason is to dispel some myths and rumors about how scary it is for people to step into the studio. You know, I think that especially people that have been natural light photographers and outdoor photographers, maybe even portrait photographers, that have just been afraid of the studio because it does seem a little scary. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of lights and a lot of equipment, a lot of stuff to deal with. And, and, and there's some concerns and, it, and there's a fear factor that's automatically sort of built in. And, and I think if we can put some of that to rest, we can maybe make it a less scary place and might make it a place that you can get in and experiment and it becomes a lab of, of learning and of creativity and, and exploration. And fun. And, and it can be an awful lot of fun. So that is, I think that's the main thing. How did you get into photography? I heard you was a little weird story. You know, for me, right. it's, I, I came into this from a very odd position. Um, my sister's husband, who, who was my best friend, I was his best man when he married my sister, um, called me out of the clear blue sky one day and said, hey, why don't you come to work for me in my new photography studio? I never owned a camera. I never thought about photography as a career. Uh, most people come at this that are professional photographers come at it from a position where they've, they've been an amateur. Yeah, I started when I was 12 were, or something. They were Just, hobbyists. Yeah. And they, you know, a lot of people were their, their high school yearbook staff photographers. It never appealed to me. It never, I never even thought about photography as a career option uh, until my brother-in-law called and offered me this position. And I said, yeah, I think I'll try that. And three months into it, I knew this is what I was supposed to be doing. And, and I knew I would never do anything else. So I came at it kind of in an odd way. The first picture I ever took was for a client. Uh, and it was on a Hasselblad. My first camera was a Hasselblad. So it's really a, an odd thing for me. I never did start with a point and shoot. Well, you did come from a visual medium, oh, yeah. though. I did, I did. I had worked for a TV station in El Paso, Texas, a local cable show that I directed and produced, a Saturday afternoon dance show, which was really sad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I did have a little bit of a visual, and I, and I connected pretty well with the camera crew, and, and I knew a little bit about composition and lighting, and, and I was kind of learning that along the way. So when my brother-in-law called me, uh, it did seem kind of like a natural fit. Yeah, so. over the years, you've really become known as, as a master of light, a uh, master mm -hmm. of lighting and, and creating these moods and shape and dimension. How did, how did that path happen? I think that happened, uh, um, a lot of, I, I'll give some credit there to Dean Collins, of course. Dean was a master photographer and a, and a great friend of mine. And I, I uh, in fact, I sold my studio in Texas in the mid-late 80s to go to San Diego to work with Dean and produce a book, a series of books and videos called Fine Light. And uh, I couldn't help but be influenced by Dean's teachings and his stylings. And, of course, then I took it and carried it another step or two and to another direction. But, it, but it real, I realized that I, was, I enjoyed teaching, and I thought I was a pretty decent teacher, and nobody was talking about light. Everybody was talking about everything except light. Photoshop there, Lightroom. Photoshop Lightroom's going on. Uh, there was landscape workshops. There was, there was all kinds of different ways of learning photography, but nobody was talking about light. The theories of light, uh, working with the science and understand how light works, and then the controls and all the creative things that we can do with light. Nobody was teaching it. And I thought that's, that's the direction I want to go. Well, you're, from, from this series, you're definitely going to get a full-blown course on that whole process. So we're talking yeah. today, <clears throat> excuse me, about one light. Yeah. Why one light? I, th I think it's the natural place to start. Um, when I started the, a traditional portrait photography studio, usually you had five lights that you worked with. A main light, a fill light, a hair light, a background light, and possibly an accent light. And, and basically you had all five lights in the studio. And, and either good or bad, sadly for me, most photographers' work started looking the same to me. Uh, because they all use the same four or five lights in the studio. And after two or three years of doing this, I was pretty bored with my career and my craft. And I thought there's got to be more than this. So I started turning lights off. Instead of adding lights, I started turning lights off. Interesting. And I was looking at the work of, of, uh, 
a, a great, great fine art photographer named Irving Penn. And in one of his books called Passages, he talks about the different chapters of his life, much, much like in the book. So one full decade, he did one like portraits. And I really? started looking at that and started paying attention to that. And what I found was that I liked my work better when I used one light and a reflector than I did if I had five lights in the studio. Now, there's reasons for all the other lights to exist, and we'll talk about that in future shows, of course. Um, in fact, but they'll get a little taste of that. We'll later. get a little taste of that today, but, but for the most part, one light, uh, you, can, you can create a signature look with one light. You can, you can give a complementary likeness to your subject. You can enhance their features with one, with one light. You can make a narrow face look broader, a broad face look more narrow. You can do a lot of things with one light if you know what you're doing. So do you think, why do you think people are afraid of these things? I think it's just the fear of the unknown. Okay. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of new photographers don't realize that inside these soft boxes and behind whatever the light shaping tools, that there's two light bulbs in there. There's a modeling lamp and then there's a flash tube. Uh, and the modeling lamp is only there for one reason, so you can focus and get a good visual of uh, an approximation of what you're going to see when you take the picture. But then the flash tube fires off separately, and the flash tube fires off at a, you know, a two thousandth of a second flash duration or one thousandth or whatever the flash duration might be, and it, it freezes the subject, and the exposure is made. So, you know, if you think about it in one respect, your shutter speed in the studio doesn't even really matter. 60th of a second, 125th, 30th, doesn't yeah. matter because it, the exposure is based on the aperture. The aperture takes care of the primary subject, and that's based on what's coming out of that flash. Yeah, there's not enough ambient light to contribute. Yeah, not to, really. Yeah, not really. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to be dealing with a monolight today. <clears throat> yeah. Just for those that aren't used to using those things, how would you define a monolight? I think a monolight, uh, for me, is best described or defined as it, it is a singular unit that is all completely self-contained. All of the, uh, the capacitors, all the controls, everything I need to do, anything I need to do with that light, everything is on the head. It has one cord and I, it's an AC cord that plugs in the wall. So all of my controls are right there on the head. It's very convenient and I can control everything in one-tenth of a stop increments or one full stop increments. So for me, the, the control is, is pretty amazing and I can get exactly what I want out of those heads by having that individual control. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little closer look at the monolight. Mm -hmm. we, we filmed a little segment the other day to zoom in on the controls so you could see, and then we'll take a little tour around the studio before we start actually playing with the lights. Perfect. So let's take a closer look. We're gonna be using a Gemini 500R, mm -hmm. uh, which is a self-contained monolight system. Take a look at the details, what you can do with it, and then we come back, we'll take a tour of the studio and then put them to use. So here, in this situation, my meter is reading 11.4, 11.4. Now, what I love about these Bowens lights is that on the left, the control knob is full stop increments. The one on the right is one-tenth of a stop increment. So let's say, for example, I want to shoot at f8, but my meter reading is giving me 11.4. I go over to the full stop. I drop it minus one from three to two. That gives me f8.4. And then I can take these tenths down all the way to zero, and now I know for sure that that's going to give me F8. And I don't need to hit the test button again because it automatically bleeds the capacitors so that it's going to give me the right output. Let's talk just for a second about the controls on the back of the Bowen's Gemini lights. So first over here on the left is the modeling positions of the modeling lamp. Right now it's got it, I've got it completely turned off. And if I toggle up one, there is REL, which is a relative brightness to the output. There's a user-defined brightness of the modeling lamp, and then there's maximum. It brings on full brightness of the modeling lamp itself. Next to that is a ready light that gives us the ability to, when the strobe is fired, it'll take the modeling lamp down to dim, and it comes back up and becomes bright once it's fully recycled. And then the next switch to that would be the beep. That beeper is, gives, gives you an audible chirp like that when the, cycle, when the cycle is complete and it's ready to shoot again. And then of course there's a switch for the cell and that's basically your white light slave so that if it sees another light it will fire automatically for you. It's a great uh, feature that really most lights do have. Now one other thing that's kind of unique about the Gemini's and that is this on off toggle switch. If I put it in the center position that turns it off and that's the AC power. But if I toggle it straight down in that position 
that bypasses the AC cord and allows me to plug in another cable here that'll go down to the travel packs. That gives me the ability to take this light head and stand outdoors on location and not even have to worry about looking for AC power. I've got a portable battery pack that can travel with me. Okay, so you've seen a close-up of what the, the controls on the Monolite do. When we look right behind us here, we've got one here. Tony, why is this better than a speed light? Well, for me, for me, speed lights are great and, they, and they've come a long way. The technology uh, from all the camera manufacturers and, and manufacturers of speed lights has really, really improved. And they've, getting, they've gotten to where they, they can think for themselves. They're mm -hmm. so smart. Uh, there's a couple of things that they don't do very well. One is they don't overpower the sun very well. No. Uh, I, need, I need some power. They certainly I'm, don't recycle fast. They don't recycle fast, and we're missing that other element, which is the, mon the, the modeling lamp. I've got to be able to see the modeling light. I need to be able to approximate what I can see on the face. And one other thing we just saw from that <clears> video <throat> was one of the reasons for not using these was you needed a power cord. Yeah. And now with those battery packs, yeah, and so, take one so of those that's the thing is for me, and, and, we've, and we've got an upcoming show on that in the future too, working on location with these travel packs. Uh, they just plug right into these guys. It's, it's fantastic. So I've got my mobile power with me, but I've also got the, the, the thrust of having these monolights. They're just so much powerful. So we've got a softbox on here. Yeah. Why softbox? Why not? I know everybody's got umbrellas with their kits. Why not an umbrella? You know, I think that, that all of the light shaping tools that we have, we have softboxes and grids and reflectors and umbrellas and all that stuff. Every single one of those tools have a right to exist. Sure, they have a use. They all have a use. Uh, for me, umbrellas are great for one thing. They, in fact, they do one thing better than anything, and that is sending light everywhere. Yeah. So for a big group? For big groups, ideally. Uh, you know, if I'm going to do a football team, I'm going to need two or three or four umbrellas, and I can light the whole team. I could not do that with any other light source. Yeah. So the light, umbrellas are great. Umbrellas are not good if you're in a small studio and you need to control light. That's where the softbox shines. And the softbox gives me you know, a great soft light source at distance that's a reasonable working distance. It also contains the light and keeps the light from spilling all over the studio. Yeah, you have control. So I've got control, and for me, that's real important. If I'm especially I'm trying to keep light off of a background, uh, I can control where it goes based on just positioning. And then, of course, there's grid spots, uh, 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 grid, uh, egg crate grids that you can put on them and really narrow that beam down so where it really it's controlled where you place and it. And we will get into that, all the we will. details of the light shaping we will, tools yeah. later. So yeah. how are we going to fire these things or well, this thing today? I like to work with the Pocket Wizards. Um, you can see one right here. This is the Bowens model Pocket Wizard. You can get them in yellow if you want this them is to my, match. This is my new yellow, and I love it. Um, what's great for me about this is I don't lose it inside a black, and the inside the black insides of a black camera bag. Yeah. I never lose my remote. <laughs> I can always spot it now. Um, but for me, so it's just sending a signal, and I've got it set to the same channel here. And then, in fact, this particular head is equipped with the new module, so it's got the, the Pocket Wizard receiver built yeah, in. So now. that is an option. You, if you have these lights, if you have the Gemini's, you can add the Pocket Wizard module if you want. Uh, if not, and you have other Pocket Wizards around, you can use one of these. I've got a Plus X right here. You just take the cable that came with it. It's just a mini phono to a quarter inch cable, and you can plug this right into the sync port in the back of the light, and when it receives the signal, then it will fire the lights. Mm -hmm. And there we go. Yeah, so, so there's a couple of different ways to trigger these lights. And, uh, but the main thing is, there's gotta be some kind of a signal that goes from my camera to the light. Right, so, and I've got mm -hmm. a plus X here. Tony's got a plus three on his camera, mm -hmm. but since everybody's on the same channel, we're actually just using channel two today. Doesn't matter if I fire the Doesn't light, matter. or hit the test button on Tony's unit, just Right. Channel two, it doesn't care. Right. Now, we're sh going to be shooting today, when we do a little live shoot portion, we're shooting tethered into Lightroom. So okay. people are going to get, you're going to get to see the shots as they happen. And to do that, we're using a Tether Tools USB cable to run from Tony's Canon Mark III into a MacBook Pro laptop. And one thing we did ahead of time yeah. was we did create a custom profile for Tony's camera under these lights, had a white balance, and then created a preset in Lightroom so that each image as it comes in the Lightroom gets the profile, gets the white balance so that they show up on the screen very Correct. close to done. They're done, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. And that's, and that's again, something that I preach in my workshops and people that have studied with me and, and hopefully some of you former students of mine are out there. Uh, one of the things that you know I preach all the time and that is get as close as you can to getting it right in the camera. Yeah. We, we've got to find ways of not, uh, not spending all evening trying to fix what we've spent all day shooting. 
Uh, so for me, it's, I really want to get as close as I can yeah, so that yeah. when, when we look at the files in Lightroom later in the library module, I want to make sure that everything's right there and you look at it and go, yeah, I don't even have to touch that and you go on to the next one. Yeah, you're not so, getting paid for that extra You're not getting paid for time. that extra com computer time. So something else we did the day before <clears throat> yesterday was Tony came into the studio and we filmed some close-up stuff to show how as you move the light position, size, angle, the effect it has on the highlights and the shadows of the face. And yeah. Tony brought his friend. I brought a model with me. I, I like to travel with my own model, so. Here's Headley. This is Headley. Headley <laughs> this is Headley P. Delwood. <laughs> <laughs> look, for, look for a chain of uh, restaurants coming soon. Uh, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if I should tell them where I got Headley, but I got Headley at a very uh, high-end uh, electronics store who shall remain nameless. Yes. Um, and he was a prop in the, one of the glass cases, and I basically slipped a kid some money and talked him out of his head 20 so we years know, ago. <laughs> yeah, we know you guys are going to be asking where you can buy yeah. this, so we'll look for it. Yeah, but it's great because it's gray. I can, I can use it as a model, and it shows me uh, my highlights, and it shows me my shadows. You can use like a, well, like a plastic, like a One of those styrofoam, white styrofoam like wig a wig, heads. Like a yeah. wig holder, yeah, wig head, uh, which are great. You've got to have something, but with that, I lose the ability to see what my highlights are doing. Something gray, a medium gray, kind of a luster shine to it. You can see the highlight side and the shadow side, so it works out really well. Yeah, and well. that's something I learned. I had been using my white head, who's Dolores, by yeah, the way. Yeah, Dolores. Oh, so go. uh, I'm going to go to a home store and buy some of that gray speckled paint. That's perfect. And I'm going to spray one of the white yeah. wig heads for that. Uh, the white thing does show shadows very well, especially if you're filming. Really well. But as Tony said, you can't see your highlights because yeah. it's, it's white. So let's take a look at this video. You're going to be amazed to see how quickly the light patterns change, how the shape changes, and how the highlights move and change size as the position and the angle of the light is changed. So and let's take a look. And, oh, it's very, and it's a very subtle change too, and, and, it's, uh, and it's also very, very subjective. You may or may not like what, we, what we've done, and that's okay. It's your, you have to take care of what you like yes. to do. So just remember that it's pretty subjective. All right, so take a look. You know, the concept of working with one light is always, I think, a sensible option in studio photography. And it's an option that is not just for the new photographer who is just stepping into the studio for the first time, but it also is a pretty good idea, and a lot of pros use it that have been long-term pros uh, as a technique. And there's a lot of, of, of pictures that are just right for one light. So it depends on the usage. But one of the things that you have to be able to remember is you've got the option on how this photograph looks. We can adjust our distance from our head to the subject, the size of our source relative to its distance, and then exact placement to create a whole variety of effects and looks. For example, if you've got someone with a really, really narrow face and you're trying to add weight to them, we would light them a little bit differently than you've got someone with a heavy face where you're trying to save a little bit of weight and maybe remove a few pounds from someone's face. Also, deep set eyes. Uh, things like that, crooked nose. There are things that we can do with light, and especially when we're working with one light, that you can really use some nice corrective sort of lighting techniques, if you will. And let me just show you a few things that we can do here, and we'll use our, our, uh, our, our stand-in model here, Headley, to, uh, to, to bounce a little bit of light off of, and let me just show you some of the options that we have available. You know, let's take a look at this light in this position. Now, if you'll notice on Headley's face, you can see that the highlights look a little bit bright, the shadows seem a little bit sharp edge, and basically the highlights are kind of small and bright. And so what happens is, as we move this light source around, let's just, let me just bring it closer and closer and closer, and you can see the highlights get larger, and as they get larger, the edge of the shadow starts becoming softer as well. From this position, I can come over here and I can split light headly to where we've got half the face lit, half of the face not lit. I can bring him around in the front and I can flat light his face, and I can basically kind of determine, utilizing some type of a stand-in prop like this, I can sort of determine how I want to light a face. For me, and to photograph someone like Joe, I'm probably going to bring my light source in fairly close, about like this, and probably at about a 45 degree angle, something like that. I might come up a little bit higher and tip my light source down just slightly. But basically, you can see that what we're doing here is nothing more than highlight and shadow control. So one light source gives us the ability to control the brightness of the highlight, the size of the highlight, and the edge of the shadow. I can make the shadow sharper or softer based on the size of the light source relative to its distance to the subject. So you need a hard edge, sharp, uh, hard edge shadow, all you have to do is back the light up. You need a soft edge shadow, bring the light in or make the light bigger. Either one of those will achieve a softer edge shadow. Those types of controls in the studio help me immensely 
in controlling what I do with one light. You know, the great painter uh, Leonardo da Vinci one time wrote in some of his papers that in order to produce depth in a painting, you have to have three brightness levels. You have to have the true brightness of your subject, a brightness that is brighter than the true brightness, and a brightness that is darker. Well, that's highlights and shadows. So he taught us we've got to have directional light in order to have highlights and shadows to produce depth, shape, form, roundness, texture, all of that that we create with light. And it's so much easier to do that with a one single light source. You can see what you're getting. Now, what's interesting about Headley, and, and you know, I got a gray head, which is perfect, because if you use a white styrofoam wig holder for your prop, for example, uh, the only issue with that is you can see your shadows great, but you really can't see your highlights. You can't read your highlights very well. So I would recommend if you're going to get a prop of some type to do this kind of work and, and to sort of as a, as a learning tool, as a, as a teaching aid for yourself, paint it flat gray or luster kind of a gray uh, tonality so you can see both highlight side and shadow side because you've got to work with both sides of the, of the coin there in terms of contrast creation and contrast control. So that's pretty important. And then also we want to talk about not just the direction of this light source, but we also have to take a talk about its positioning. And again, you know, in portrait photography, we've all been taught that your main light should be 45 degrees from the subject. That came from some of da Vinci's papers where he said the shadow on the ground from your subject should be as long as your subject is tall. Now, if you think about that, that's, that's a 1505 way of saying 45 degrees. If I've got a six-foot shadow from a six-foot man, my light's going to be at 45 degrees. And I think that while that's kind of one of those rules of thumb, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty close. Generally speaking, if your light's at a 45 degree off to the side and 45 degrees up, you're going to have some pretty good light. It might need to be altered if somebody's got deep-set eyes or if they're wearing a hat, if they've got a lot of hair in the front of their face, a lot of bangs. There's some adjustments that can be made. But with one light, folks, I'm telling you, you can do so much more work than you can imagine. And it's really not as difficult as it seems. So, you know, one of the other options, too, when you want to feather your light source in an effort to elevate the brightness of your background is we're, at this distance, we're pretty far away from that dark gray uh, seamless paper. So let's just move everything closer. We'll move the light closer. We'll move Headley closer. So we'll do it like this. We're just going to roll him back here closer to the background. Maybe something like that. And then let me just grab my light source and I'm just going to roll it closer and we'll keep the same distance between the light source and Headley. And you can see I'll bring it in, in, in. And I'm just going to flip this to a horizontal situation. And now I'm just going to feather that light toward the background, toward the background, toward the background. Bam, right in there. Now look at the brightness difference from the background as where it was before. Uh, first of all, what, Tony, what's your favorite size softbox for a one-light portrait? Well, I think if I, if I only had one, it would probably be the 80 by 100, which this is, this is that size. This is, it's kind of a medium size softbox, and it's great for headshots, and it's great for three-quarter length. If I was shooting full length, I probably wouldn't use it. Um, but I like it. I think it's a pretty good size all around. Uh, then there's also another one that's a square size that's 100 by 100. I think I like that one quite a bit as well. Okay. But the, the 80 by 100 or the, the 100 by 140, uh, those are both pretty good sizes. And uh, yeah, that, that covers for most of the work that I need to do. A couple of you mentioned that you don't know that much about Bowens, uh, and uh, they have been somewhat hidden until recently, so we're, we're making sure yeah, but that they've they, been around a long time. <laughs> they have been around a long time. In fact, they're the guys that invented the monolight. Yeah, So 45 years ago. They've been around for a long time. Uh, so speaking of the monolight, mm -hmm. if you in a battery pack, how do you work around the fact that you lose the modeling light when you go off a battery yeah, and pack? Yeah, that is, and that is a, it's a great question, and it is something that, that will happen. Um, and I'm sort of glad that it does bypass the modeling lamp ability. Uh, basically, when I take this out on location, lose the AC cord and plug in the cord that goes to the travel pack battery, um, I do lose my modeling lamp. I just have to know what's going to happen. And a lot of that is going to be experience having worked in the studio some. Uh, certainly, I'm going to use my meter to make sure my exposure is accurate and, and correct. Uh, but placement of that, I, I, I pretty much know where it needs to go, and, and you'll, you'll feel your way into this. If you've done this uh, some, you probably already have a good feel for it. If you haven't done it at all, you'll find your way into it, and, and it won't take you very long. You'll recognize, you know, uh, we talk a lot about 45-degree lighting. I'm not sure where we lost the video there, but I did discuss in there about uh, Leonardo da Vinci talked about 45-degree light source in painting. 
so 45 from the camera and 45 up gives beautiful uh, light quality on the face, which has shape, form, texture, dimension, uh, and depth, what we call three-dimensional three contrast. And as long as we can create that depth, uh, you can kind of guesstimate where that 45 yeah, and we can, is. We can show, we'll make sure we cover that well when we go to live so yeah, we sure. can see that. Sure. Uh, someone asked a question about uh, recommended lights if you have a small studio. They mentioned like 15 by 30. Uh, I can actually answer that because our studio is almost exactly 15 by 30. And generally, we get by fine with the, uh, we have some Gemini 400 RXs yeah. that we use in our studio. Uh, if it's a little bit bigger group, are we going to move into another location? What we use is a 500 as our main, and then we'll use the 400s because they're light uh, as our hair and Accents, our fill, sure. our accent lights, sure. uh, because it's nice to be able to put a small amount of light up on a boom. Yeah. rather than the bigger, heavier ones. It's just, just it's great, for it's safety issues. So, and the cost is... is it's, yeah, for, I mean, you can't beat the price. The kit is right. under $900 for, for two, heads. two lights, yeah. stands, everything. Yeah. So, Tony, let's continue on. So, okay. size and direction of the light source yeah. is going to have a big effect on it. And we've seen some demonstrations. And you're going to see in just a few minutes some right. examples of what happens as you change that. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, though, especially if you're out and about and you've lost your modeling light, how do you get your perfect exposure when you're doing this? You know, you, if you talk to three photographers, you're gonna get three completely different answers. And uh, I don't know which one's right, and I won't ever tell anybody what to do with their work. I, I will. will. I, I will. I will t <laughs> well, there's a lot of guys that are like that. No, you must do this. Yeah. Um, I won't do that to anybody, but I will tell you what I do and how it works for me and why I'll never do it any other way. Uh, for me, it's a very simple matter of making sure that my dome, my, my incident meter, uh, and this is, of course, today I'm working with my L758DR, which is my favorite meter in the world. It's, it is the best meter there is until you drop it. <laughs> hey, Tony would know all about that, by yes, the way. Yes, it fell off of uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia a while back. Um, but, but I think it's a, it's a very smart meter, but it only has one brain when it's in the incident mode, not the spot, mo spot meter mode. And that, in and, and that one brain is reality. And so that's what I, I think of it as my reality meter. So if I'm under the light source here, if I'm being lit by the softbox here, I'll place, you know, my camera is right here where the video camera is, where we got Rick back there. I've got the dome, I'll place it right under my subject's chin, and I want to make sure that that dome is fully illuminated by my main light. So I just so go... You know, for a single for, light, you're going to point Single back light, I'm going to go light. right there. Yes. And whatever it says, yes. that's my exposure. In fact, let me turn this on. That's something that does throw people off. <laughs> it, when you're dealing with a single light, meter back to the light, not back to the camera. So here's, here's, the, here's the thing. So here I am here, I've got my transmitter turned on. So as I fire it off, it gives me exactly eight and a half, F eight and a half. If I shoot at eight and a half at this face, <laughs> what I see is what I get. This, I will look like I, that I, that like I really look because we're calibrated yeah. to do that. Yes, it's perfect. One, I do want to tackle one object here about the, about the meter aiming back at the camera. If you're aiming the, the dome of your meter back toward the camera, you're okay if your light source is within 45 degrees of the camera. If you are more than 45 degrees away from the camera's position, you've got a problem and you're going to start to see a little bit of overexposure introduced because that shadow has no part in the exposure overall. Right. So I think you can get yourself in real trouble yeah. if you have a hard light at a strong angle and you're not metering that light, you're going to have some overexposure issues. And we'll get into, in the future, yeah. adding multiple lights. And if you've got a fill light, then your meter direction is going to end up changing a little right. bit. So size, distance... Is there a good starting point for where you like to position your subject relative distance-wise to, to a softbox? Soft okay, so, so here's a really weird one. Um, there's, a, there's a great, great photographer and a great educator named Joseph Meehan who lives uh, up here in the Northeast. And, and Joseph taught me one time, we were in Germany at a, at a conference, and he said, I always try to use a softbox that is the same size as the area of my subject I'm going to photograph. Interesting. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, if you're going to do a headshot from here to here, mm -hmm. why don't you use a softbox that's that size and bring it in until it's just in the frame and then back it up an inch. And if you back up and I'm going to do a three-quarter length, why don't you use a softbox that's this size, bring it in until you can just see it, and then back it up an inch. And I thought, this guy's nuts. And then I tried it, and this guy's <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> so, so it is something that I do think about. And, and I noticed that when I shoot full length, I do want a big softbox. I want a four by six or something large yeah. uh, or a big panel to light through or and, something. And if you don't have one, you can get make two it. lights. You get two lights and stack them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've often done that too. 
and then you just match up the power so that the, there's no fall off of light from a model's face all the way down to her feet and her shoes, especially if it's a fashion shoot and you're trying to get the, you know, the garment well lit. You want, you, you want no fall off of light, but I still need that direction, upward light coming slightly downward. So as soon as I can do that, then have my second light below, then, then you're onto something. All right, so I mentioned that uh, we did have this video, a little slideshow Tony put together where he shows some of his work. And in particular, what I was fascinated by, I thought it was one of the greatest teaching tools I've ever seen, was with the hands. Yeah, the ceramic and hands. Pay attention to this, because you're gonna see what happens to both the shadow and the highlights as the distance of the light changes to, in proportion to the hands and the background. This is really powerful stuff, and you're gonna be amazed what you can do with just one light. So let's take a look at that. In One Light Portraiture, you'll come to understand how the direction of light is a really big, important part of this overall picture here. And as we go through and take a look at some of these examples, you can see how all of these that I'm showing you were all done with one light, and we've really utilized that one light to sort of control the look of this portrait. In this case, you can see this, what looks like an accent light on her right cheek and in her hair a little bit. That's not a secondary light, folks. That's just a silver reflector bouncing some of the main light back into her shadow side of her face. And it worked quite effectively. Here's a young man we photographed in Seattle where it's literally one light, it's profile light, and he had this great uh, faux hawk kind of a hair style that looked really good. And we had a lot of variety with that. Again, with a one light situation, you can see that great catch light in the eye, good sharp, sharp contrast, uh, nice solid shadows, rich color. All of that's a result of one light. Here's one light backstage at an event on a, on a stage and Minneapolis and it was just one softbox up on a light stand up high really shooting straight down almost on her face. Again one light on her and it spilled onto the background just slightly and you can understand how working with something that's dark the highlight is everything in terms of contrast so when you work with light skin you work with shadows when you work with dark skin you work with highlights and keep in mind it's all about the size of a light source relative to its distance to the subject that's what one light portraiture is all about as long as you understand that size of source relationship and the distance boy you can really create some really great work here's a small vase with a light source it's a pretty far distance away from that subject so in that case look at the highlight it's very small it's very bright and as we can increase the size of that source, the highlight becomes almost a, an element of the picture itself. And in these ceramic hands, I, I know I want to bring in a little bit of a reflector on the top hand just to separate that finger up there where it's a little bit dark in the, in the background area. So there we just bounced a little reflector in there. And again, this is, this is working with one light and a dark, dark subject. Now, what's interesting about this is if we... If, here's, here, here it is again with one light source and you can see the highlights and you can sort of see the brightness or the darkness of the highlights as we change their size relative to the distance here we just backed that main light back up way way back from we went from two feet back to about seven or eight feet and you can see let me back up and do that again watch this watch the highlight get brighter and smaller at the same time and that's the theory of physics that's what happens with the law of the inverse square and then so so here you can see that you know, all about the highlight everything about working with a dark dark highly polished subject is about it's a it's an element of and an exercise in highlight control and if we switch that out to now a white subject ah now we're talking about the shadows and you can see the shadowing under the fingers there's so much to talk about now here we've got our subject and we've got white and black in this shot he's got this dark 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 black leather um, jacket on this uh, duster if you will and he's got snow white hair so the shadowing is what's given me that great contrast in his hair on his face and his eyes and then look at the highlights across the top of that jacket that all helps and again one light on location now then the next obvious step would be to to add one two three more lights to the set and we're going to talk about that in the future webinar but for this one you can see that if I turn off all the accent lights there's just my main light but we've completely lost the separation on her waist up against where the where the sofa is and you can see where her waist and her hip are just completely gone we can't see her true shape form or, or design or depth so if we bring on one accent light 
right there. Now we can start to see the reason for adding a second light on a set, or maybe in this case, another little accent. And now we start to see the reason for adding a third light on the set. So as you can see, we're going to start becoming more and more complex as this series goes forward on working with light control in the studio, utilizing these great Bowen's Gemini lights. Okay, so amazing stuff, Tony. Thanks. Uh, That's fun. And I really I love that, that demonstration with the hands because I've never seen a better illustration of what happens as your light source distance changes to the subject. I used to, I used to teach with, a, uh, with a, a billiards eight ball next to a white styrofoam cup. So I would teach highlights and shadows with, That's cool with, with those two tools. But the hand, the hand the something about great. the hand just, just really works yeah, well. That's just fun. <laughs> uh, one question that came through, uh, there's a couple of guys from Bones that are answering your questions. Thank you guys Thank you for to, doing that. to Jason and David for that. Sure. Uh, so if you're not in the chat room, you're missing out. Just check it out. Uh, it was a question, it's a good question. And somebody asked, why when if you're using one flash, do you meter to the light source while in the sunlight, you need to avoid direct exposure onto the dome? And that's a really good question. And the reason for it is, if I can borrow your meter a second, when you're out in the sun, every, people don't think of the sun as a point light source. It's when, a, it, is, it, is it is an is, enormous source, but it's it, 93 million miles away. Yes. So, <laughs> yes, it's illuminating everything, but that one little dot is a point light source. It's as if you took your softbox off and you put your flash 100 meters away. Yeah. So even though it's illuminating everything, there's that one really super bright, hot dot that is showing up on the top of the meter. That's why when we meter outside, we just, I, I do it, I get a finger in between the dome and the point of the sun so I can just mask out that little specular dot because it is so much brighter than the ambient light that it, it'll, it'll cause an underexposure. Under You'll underexpose generally about two thirds. I was gonna of the say a third to two thirds. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. So in a soft box, even though it's relatively small compared to the sun, it's only this far away very from close. the meter. Yeah. So it is an even, very large light source that is uniform over the entire dome. But very good question. Yeah, and, and the thing that I always sort of try to keep people in mind is uh, its size is always relative to its distance to the subject. Yes. This is a big, nice, soft source if my subject is this tall. Yeah. If it's 20 feet away and I've got a 10 yes. foot subject, it's a very small source. So, so that's, that's the whole story. Right. The, the size, distance. Size relative distance. If you take this beautiful soft box and move it 40 feet away, I got a you might as well source. not even have it on there. Use the sunlight. <laughs> so Tony has agreed now for our action part of our, our presentation here. I don't know what I was thinking. To really take on a challenge. He's going to photograph this. He's going to photograph me and try to make me look good. So I'm not sure what to do with a face like this, but, but we'll take a stab at it anyway. I love you too. So first things first is I want to get Joe positioned. All right. Let me, let me get over here and uh, let me get this light I'm brought in. the meter for you? To position. Oh, I think that's all right. Oh, and also, just so people know again, we're shooting tethered into Lightroom. You're going to be able to get to see the screen as the image pops up. And what we did was we created a profile for these lights for the camera so that this gets applied as the image goes into Lightroom. So we know. So it's preset. It's preset, done. color balance, yep. perfect color profile. Um, initially, as new photographers begin, they'll, they'll kind of flatten this light pretty close to their camera's angle. And you can see how flat the face sort of looks. And that's fine, except that it's adding weight to the face. So Thank you. let's I don't not need do that. that. <laughs> if I can move this light a little bit more to the side, you know, say here's 45, and maybe even a little bit further, you can start to see I'm introducing some I'm introducing some modeling on the face. So I've got some highlights and shadows, and I think about the face as the mask of the face. So I've got uh, there are five there are five points of the mask of the face. I think uh, the tip of the nose, the chin, both cheeks, and then right between the eyes on the forehead. So that mask of the face is what I'm looking at when I'm positioning my light and when I'm trying to look at my subject and determine what I'm going to do next. Um, but first things first, I've got my transmitter in my meter. That's my Pocket Wizard product. And it, so it matches the channel that I'm on here. So I can hit my test button with my meter and I get my, exactly what my exposure is going to be. So I'm going to put it again right under the chin, aim it right at the light source, pull the trigger, and it says F11.0. So if I shoot at 11, it's saying I'll have reality. Yeah. I'd rather go down a little bit. So I'm going to drop it one stop and I'm going to take it down. Let's take it down there and I'm going to do it one more time and see if I can't get closer to eight. 
So now I'm at 8.0. So now if I shoot at f 8.0, I'm going to get exactly what Joe looks like. Um, so let's take a shot. For what yeah, that's worth. Good or bad. Uh, <laughs> let me get back here and get him positioned. So, Joe, you're standing just about right. Let me move this light just a little bit. I'm just going to feather this light in front of you slightly. Okay, take some light off the just, background. Just a little bit, and I'm trying to get this edge of the light on the inside of the box to give a little so bit on the side. the shadow. Yeah, exactly. Here. That's exactly what it is. So you're standing just about right. I just want you to kind of from your waist, just lean right over your belt a little. That's yep. it. Yeah, yeah. Now turn your head to me slightly, a little bit more, and let the top of your head just tip in right there. Good, good, right there. Don't move. Nobody moves. Nobody gets hurt. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my motto. All right, let me find you right here. There you are. Good, good, good. I'm going to tip my camera very slightly. Great. Good, so you good. tip the camera why? I tip my camera because it just gives a little bit more of a sort of a, what I like to think of as dynamic symmetry to the face. Little, it it little puts angle. a little bit of a tilt. And, and it's not much. You can see from, the, from my positioning here. It's just a little bit, but I think it does add a little bit. Um, let me just take a look at that and see how we did there. How's it? Did that come in? Considering the subject matter, it doesn't look half bad. Might be um, my new Facebook profile picture. That one didn't pop in yet. Oh, yeah, I think that is the last one. No, because that's chair. See the chair there? Oh, in, yeah. In the wrong shirt. Okay. That was our Let's test. See. Let's oh, try this. I okay, just... now it's working. <laughs> now we're doing. Let's do this again. All right. You know what? Let me, uh, let me just restart tethering. Okay. Yeah, so while he's doing that, folks, let me just reiterate. There's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, you know, photography, if you, look at, if you look at photography, it's defined as the science and art uh, concerned with forming and fixing of an image onto a plate or film made sensitive to light. It's always science and art in all the definitions that I've, that I've seen uh, in dictionaries. So we've got to know the science part of it, sure. But it is still an art, and it is still about opinions. And, uh, boy, subjectively, everybody's got their opinion of what they like and what they don't like. That's for sure. Okay, so we, yep, we're going. Okay. I think I'm in kind of the same spot. Yep, let me just take a look in here. Oh, you look great. You've never looked better. There you go. There you, you go. Just the lights off. Huh? Turn the lights <laughs> off. There we go. That should be popping in. There you go. Yeah, that looks pretty good. But you can see now by having the light direction the way we've got it and the way we've got him posed, it's basically doing a pretty decent job of, of bringing light off of, off of all of the face. So it's, it's sort of... It's almost, um, it's almost selective area lighting, if you will. And that is really good for, for helping uh, when you want to add weight to a face or take weight away from a face. So in this case, let me do one other change here. Let me grab the reflector here. Okay. You stay right where you are. All right. I'm just gonna... Also, by the way, Jen, if you'd make the screen full for just a second, uh, one thing we also like to point out is take a look at that histogram in the upper right. I know there's a lot of photographers, when they see that, they'll panic and think they're way underexposed. But that is exposed perfectly. Even though you've got that big uh, mountain peak over on the left-hand side, it's because there's so much dark in the image. That is what this <coughs> histogram should look like. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing if you see a lot of dark area. It just means that it is dark in those areas. Now, I'm just going to bring this reflector forward a bit. And I, and I position my reflectors a little bit differently than a lot of people. A lot of people Definitely have than I do. I just learned this this morning. Most people will have their reflector right here pretty flat to the subject, sort of like in this position. What I've learned over the years is I like it a little bit more forward and at a little bit of an angle. And it gives me the ability to do some things that I previously couldn't do. So for example, if I want to slightly change my ratio of contrast from Right now, I'm at a pretty, high, a pretty high ratio or a pretty low ratio of maybe a 2 to 1 or something like that from highlight to shadow. But I can change that by how much light I let spill onto that reflector from the main light yeah. position. So I can change that ratio by just simply swiveling this a little bit. It's amazing what you can do. It's just a little bit of movement. It's a, just a little bit of movement. You can really change things. So let's do another one with a little bit of a fill. Do you want to re-meter? I think I'm closer. Yeah, you are closer. So good call there. Let's back, in fact, let's back you up just a half a step. That's it right there. Perfect. I'll get, put a little bit right there. Let's just check that. Yeah, we picked, up, we picked up a little bit. So I'll close down third on that. So we're about F9 now? Yep. So I'm going to come around just a little. Now, again, lean forward right over your belt. And folks, when you're wondering why I'm doing that, I'm saving him 10 pounds right under the chin. 
That's that's all I'm doing, <laughs> and he knows it. <laughs> and oh, yeah. I wasn't gonna tell him. <laughs> Great. Now just bring your head to me just a little bit. Just just your head, a little bit more. Right there. Perfect. 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 Good. Good one. Great. That's much much nicer there. I think. I do want to get a little bit of a fill, a little bit closer. So I'm just gonna bring this in just a little more forward, and that just picks up a little spill from this, and it just helps open up the face a little bit more. So I'm just gonna come in right in here. Here we go. Right there. Great. Good. Now, I want to make one other change here, and then I'm going to have him reposition a little bit. Um, and that change is simply, I want to turn here. I'm going to get this out of the shot because what I'm doing next is a little bit more dramatic, maybe. Uh, but it gives me a little bit more of a flexibility issue. I'm just going to take my softbox and turn it horizontal. So I'm just going to spin it this way. Okay. So now it's a little bit horizontal. I'm going to back you up a half step that way, and I'm going to move this forward a half step. I'm going to keep the same distance. But now I'm just going to let this light pivot just a little bit closer toward the background. Just about like that. Okay. And in doing so, all I'm doing is I'm able to open up that background just a little bit. Now, this is one of the nice things about using a gray background. You well, can make it go really light to black. And that's the thing. This is a pretty dark gray. But if you get a gray that's just even one stop brighter than this gray, you can really do a lot with it. So again, let's just lean you forward right over the belt just like that and bring your head back in here. Let the top of your head just barely, and your eyes right in here. Let me just look at your eyes for a second. I'm looking at the eyes because I really want that catch light. I want to make sure where that catch light is. So you've got to have, you've got to have the, the life in those eyes or you're in trouble. What's your philosophy about eyes towards the lens or eyes uh, it depends. It depends on the subject. Okay. It, it really does. It kind of depends on what I'm, what I'm doing. What I do want to make sure, let me just shoot this real quick right there. Good. What I do want to make sure that I do, and this sounds kind of goofy, I don't want the chin... The, the mask of the face and the shoulders go in the same direction. I want something to change. So like here, I've got him turned a little bit this way, but I've got his head turned just a little bit. So I don't want him to be like, turn your head toward this way. Right there, I can't do that. I gotta make sure that there, there's, a, there's a movement in that neck. I gotta have it turned slightly. How about, yeah. shoulder, how about front shoulder? What would you do? With Same that? with your, the way you're standing is fine. Yeah. But I think that a lot of people want the weight on the back foot and let the front foot, and then it drops that shoulder. Well, that's a little bit more of a feminine, feminine pose. feminine, yes. That's right. This is more of a power pose from a, from a masculine position. Yes, so let me just take a look at that last one there. <laughs> yeah, so now we've got, now you're starting to see we're opening up that background, and our, our black, black, black background's gone away. So that's terrific. I'm just going to toggle back one stop, one click. So there is the previous shot. That's with the reflector. With the reflector and a black background. And then this is without the reflector and with a lighter grayer background. And the subtle changes are so easy to make, you guys. And it's really quick and easy way to, uh, to really change up a photograph. Let me, let me put you in this stool for just a second, All Joe. Right. And in this case, I'm going to have your shoulders turned opposite the light. So I'm going to put you at a 45, kind of going that direction. Okay. Now, one of the things that you, know, you learn early on in photography is that light... When lighting into a flat subject, you lose depth and shape and textures. It flattens out clothing. It flattens out features. Uh, and, you, and if you're wedding photographers, you know that when you're photographing a bride and you turn that bride's shoulders into your light source, whatever it is, you lose all the modeling on the gown. You lose the beadwork. You lose the pearls. You lose everything on that gown. Uh, and, and you lose any depth and shape of the model themselves. And, so in this case, that beautiful decolletage. That beautiful, that's it. <laughs> so I'm going to turn you just a little bit. I want your shoulders coming toward me a little bit more, a little bit more. There you go. Now then, leave your shoulders right there and bring just your head this way. More, more, more. And let me have your eyes right here for a second. Perfect, right there. So now I'm just going to try to open him up a little bit this way. And your eyes are going to be right about in here. I'll be right here for you to look at. Let me just kind of set this standard here. And again, I, I would normally take another meter reading, but I haven't changed my distance. So I know exactly what I'm getting here. Let me just back up and just, you can see the position here. Now I've got his, I'll come back and get his hands in just for one shot and then I'll come forward a little bit. Here we go, there we go. Good, good, good. Great, I'm gonna come back in now. I'm just gonna zoom a little bit here. Perfect, I just wanna roll your shoulders that way a little bit further, a little bit more even. That's it, now bring your head back more, more. I know it's hard, I know it hurts. But as they say, you have to suffer if you want to be a star. Your eyes right at me, right here. Good, good, good. Great. Also, one Perfect. other note, when you've got your model sitting in a chair, don't have them sit deep in the chair. Yeah, you want to sit get them on, on the Get them on edge. the edge of the seat because you don't want big butts. Well, and not just that. Unless it also, really it also helps keep their shoulders up straight. Yeah, yeah. So.
I cool. Think we, I think we got it. Let me take a look at that last one. Yeah, that's looking pretty darn good right there. So here's the previous one. And actually, along, since and we've got one, one in the chair, why don't we bring in the reflector for one so they sure. can see that as well? Sure. Okay. And then we'll see if we've got any questions and we'll take it from there. So let me bring this in a little bit further. So again, notice how close the reflector is. It might be just at a camera again, range. Again, the longer the focal length of the lens, the closer you can get things to your subject because of the perspective of your lenses. So I always like to work with the longest lens I can get away with in the studio. It's just, that's just a habit. And for me, that's just kind of the way I like to think. Okay, so now let's just bring your head around again and your chin down a tiny bit. And that, there you go. Man, it's too much. Come back up a little. That's it. That's it. And your eyes are going to be right there. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I don't know about perfect, but not bad. How's that? Right here at me. Good. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think we got it. I think we got it. And yeah, there we go. So now you can see there's our, there's the previous shot. And then here's the one we just did. So you can see that ratio changes from, you know, like a four to one ratio between highlight and shadow to closer to a three to one, almost a two to one ratio between highlight and shadow. So I don't know what's right because I don't know your client. I'm not sure what it is that you want to shoot, but the option is there, and you've got some. You've definitely got some. Um, you definitely got some options there. So let me iPad. get this camera pushed out of the way. Where'd my iPad go? There it is. Get this right over here. So we got some questions there, Joe. Yes, let's take a look. Okay. Okay, so when you're using a softbox, in fact, if you can maybe turn that around the side because they're asking about the front. Sure. How, how big a factor is having a, this, this recess panel for controlling light? Well, I think a recess panel is always, is always helpful. It's not, it's not required. Uh, but it is helpful because if it's recessed and if you've got this Velcro that goes all the way to the edge, mm -hmm. then there are, ex there are uh, external components that you can put on there, like the such grid. as the grid. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, folks, uh, it might seem like the grids are very, very expensive. Man, you got to have them. They are so helpful to have when you're on a shoot because it might be a situation where I've got a white background and I've got to keep light off from hitting it. And I can put a grid there and no light will spill yeah. to that background. We'll get into, when we get into the light shaping tools yeah. later on in the series, we'll, we'll show you all about grids. And sure. They're actually, the, the soft grids for these are not expensive. Good. Uh, they're actually fairly inexpensive and they really keep the light channeled going in one It doesn't direction. focus the light, but it channels the light yeah. and, and directs it. Tony, how do we sum up? How do we sum up one light? Um, I, think, I think the main thing is, my, my biggest point across, and certainly for the new photographers that are paying attention today, uh, don't be afraid to get in there and try this stuff. You see how simple this can be. You get one light and you get a meter and you, you know, get a subject of some type and, and take an exposure reading and do exactly what the meter tells you. You're calibrated, your monitor's calibrated, your, your meter works the way it's supposed to work, and, and remember the, that the incident meter is a reality meter. A reflected meter, a spot meter, doesn't really have a place in this particular instance. Right. Uh, I don't care how much light is bouncing off of any surface in here, but I do care about how much right. light is striking. Mm. And that's and what I, your camera's doing. Well, that's right. Your camera's just measuring what's that's coming just back a, off. That's just a reflected source. Um, I do want to tackle one other topic. I'll ask a question that nobody asked yet. Okay. With metering and exposure especially, okay. what about the difference between a light subject and a dark subject Good question. in exposure? You don't change the way you meter. You change the way you light. And, and the way I've sort of learned to word it in workshops and, and in some of the books and writings that I've done over the years is you have to learn to light for someone's tonality, but you can't vary or change your exposure because of someone's tonality or a subject's tonality. A black car is supposed to look black. That's its job. It's dark. And a white car should look white. That's its job. We did talk about one subject where this did not apply. Or you had to do something else. Your Labrador. If you're going to photograph a black lab, black labs, if you look up the word black Labrador in the dictionary, it says light sucking dog. <laughs> a black lab will eat up every bit of light in the room. And so in that instance, you've got to use a lot of edge lighting and accent lighting coming forward. To, to show some sheen and some texture in their coat yeah. of their fur. But boy, without that, you just you can put all the light you want on there and you're never gonna get much detail in the hair. I think this was a phenomenal start. 
Good. to a new series. We've got a whole bunch of them planned over the next couple of months. In fact, you've also got something new going on. Can you tell us about Team Bones? I can, yeah. If you, uh, you know, it's funny, my, my new responsibility here working with these guys at the Mac Group and working with, with Bones and specifically, uh, I'm going to sort of oversee a group of photographers that we're going to bring in called Team Bones. And one of the first things that we've started is uh, we're starting live today and announcing for the first time TeamBowens.com. So if you go to TeamBowens.com, what you'll find is, uh, at least for right now, you'll start seeing a, a pretty active blog. That blog we're going to add to at least a couple of times every week. Uh, there's three or four articles on there now, and we've got several already done in the can, and they'll be posting next week. Uh, but it's going to be a very uh, educational site, and it's going to be an educational blog. Uh, it's not going to be a, here's my pretty pictures, don't you think they're nice? It's not that. Yeah, it's a teaching tool. This is a teaching yeah. tool, and so it is a free blog that we want everybody to go to and feel comfortable, you know, um, bookmark it and come to it regularly. If you've got questions on the lower right corner of the interface, as you toggle, as you roll down and scroll down and read one of the blog entries, you'll see that you can enter a question. And I'm going to look at this thing every day and answer questions. So please feel free to jump in there at any time and ask questions. Um, I, think it, I think it'll be real helpful. And, uh, and also some suggestions about up, upcoming topics as well. So you can't beat it. You guys are being offered a free education in f photographic lighting by a master photographer, a master lighter, a master educator. You Ma can't, master knucklehead. And you can't, well, that too. <laughs> and, you, and you can't beat the price. So right. we all learn from each other. Even if you're an experienced photographer, you're going to learn new things. If you're starting out, you'll learn to get rid of the fear. Yeah, I think just, so. I hope so. That's the, that's the idea. So I think you started by showing. It's really not that hard to do. Just get that. You got to get that, that one light correct first yep. before right. you start adding your other lights. Right. Speaking of which, just going back to your slideshow, we can reference back that a second. You did show an example of a time to bring in one or two more lights. There are times when you do need to bring in one or two more lights. I might need an accent light to separate your shoulder from that background. I might want a little separation in your hair from that background. I might want a, a, a creative look and put a spotlight or a, or a splash of color across that backdrop. And all of those are instances where you do need a second light, a third light, maybe even a fourth light. If I'm photographing a family of six, I can't light them all with one light from this one side. I am going to have to bring in some more lights. So certainly we're going to tackle that in the future, and we're going to talk about sort of a building process of how to, how to establish and build the foundation for a picture. Great. Well, Tony, this has been exciting. Thank you so Thanks much. Still. I'm looking forward to working with Thanks, you so me too. much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for the great questions. Thanks for joining us. Again, we'll have a recording up. Give us, give us a day or two to get that recording up. And look for the next one. There's a whole much more to come, and it's going to be great. So thanks for watching. Until next time, Tony, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Take care.